almost good. Let's see more from the Good evening and welcome to the October meeting of the Granville Exempted Village School Board. Thank you all for being here. Would you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, let's take the roll and then. Uh, Commendations. I, I know that um, Mr. Brown would like to make a couple of observations around uh, uh, significant loss to our community and our schools. So um, many of you are aware that uh, we lost a staff member this week at Sarah Danford, who uh, has been teaching in Granville schools for 46 years. Uh, lost a battle uh, with a long illness um, this weekend. Uh, there are teachers in our organization that were in her classroom. Uh, Sarah was the epitome of excellence in education. And uh, it's a tremendous loss for our students, staff, and the entire community. 46 years, that's 1972, I was born then. Uh, Sarah, I remember talking to her on multiple occasions and and she just kept reiterating her love and desire to teach. And um, it was unparalleled. And so I'd ask you to join me in a moment of silence. achievement and uh, quite honestly Sarah the only way that she would allow us to recognize her um, is in that format because she always hated the attention um, and, and she uh, she would tell you um, <laughs> if, if you violated that so um, this year eight Granville High School students have been recognized by the National Merit Program we have five Granville High School students who are recognized as National Merit Commended Scholars for their outstanding academic promise after taking the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholar qualifying, qualifying test known as the PSAT. I'd like to congratulate Georgia Bain, Jordan Chodak, Max Lerner, Katie Hauser, and Logan Smith as commended scholars. Come on up. As <laughs> Coming queen, so it's been a good senior year, right? So yeah. far, all right. Well, let's get a picture here for all the parents. Parents, if you want to step forward for a picture, yeah, you can come on up. for their high scores on the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test 
They qualified as National Merit semifinalists and will apply to earn finalist status. Congratulations to Kieran Lele, Kristen Zainal, and Bjorn Ludwig. Come on. Yeah. 
you know, that, that would be the highlight of the What did you guys say when you kicked him when you kicked him? Yeah. <laughs> there, one, what, there was one also, another omission from Kristen's report that the freshman class took second place, and that float was in my garage for a week and a half. <laughs> and, uh, so I was pleased to get it out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our first uh, staff report tonight is on federal funding. Gwen and I are going to talk about some of the different funding sources we get from uh, the federal government. Um, really, this is required of both of us at different times in here. We decided to combine them into one um, and just give you a brief update on uh, what our plans are with those funds and um, what, what we can spend them on. So the um, first thing we'll talk about is Title I Part A. So the money that we get for this is based completely on uh, what, what the federal government calls disadvantaged youth. <clears throat> the funding for this is uh, made uh, on an income-based metric based on the number of free and reduced lunch population that you have. Um, so this is something we got about, about $130,000 um, this year uh, for this school year uh, from the federal government. That actually is a little bit more than we received in previous years. Um, and what that tells you is our free and reduced lunch population increased a little bit. It was kind of a surprise when we got that, um, but our numbers have gone up since the early 2000s when this benchmark was first set. Um, one of the guidelines that you'll hear as part of this is supplement, not supplant. So what this means is with these federal funds, you can't say, oh, we're going to pay for this program or this opportunity for students now with this money. You can't supplant, or you can't, um, supplant something you already have in place. You can only supplement what you currently have. Um, so what we've chosen to uh, use the, these funds for is what's called targeted assistance. We're looking at at-risk populations. These include historically at-risk populations. So it's not just for Granville, it's really from a nationwide and state perspective. Uh, they include minority populations, homeless populations, foster care, academically at risk, and low-income uh, family income students. So we specifically target students that fall into those categories, and some students may fall into several of those categories. Um, for assistance with these particular funds. What we've chosen to spend those on, um, we've had two district employees that provide early literacy intervention um, in grades K through three. Um, that has been present as far as long as I can remember, so that goes back to 2000 where we've had some of these fun, funds paying for um, early inter literacy intervention at the elementary school. And then with the small increase that we got this year, we um, expanded our summer reading intervention program with the new demands of the third grade guarantee um, and what students are expected to perform going into third grade we're now providing more summer intervention to prevent that summer loss of, of uh, gain that you get during the school year in these at-risk populations or at-risk students um, so we're able to um, expand that program for our rising first second third and then even some fourth and fifth graders as well this year um, at no cost to the parents and our teachers provide all that intervention so that is something that's a supplement not a supplant because that was not in place at the level that we've had before uh, title II funds Ryan, real quick. Yeah. Uh, how many students do we have in the district that are on free and reduced lunch uh, thomas i don't know if i can give you the exact number but percentage wise it's about five or six percent depending on the building so um, somewhere what is that neighborhood of 150 students 100 give or take yeah uh, Title II funds um, are allocated to spend uh, only on improving teacher quality. Um, so these are professional development funds. Our allocation for that this year was about $40,000. That allocation is for our entire school district and any students or schools located within that district. So 10% of our population within the Granville School District um, actually includes students that go to Granville Christian Academy. They're included even though they're not all from Granville. Uh, the vast majority are not from Granville. Um, they're included in that population, so we actually have to funnel and be the recording agent for 10% of those funds um, that go to GCA. And that's true of any public school in the state of Ohio. If you have private schools within your boundary, you're responsible for administering the Title II Part A funds, and they get a percentage of what you get based on their own population. So um, that's why Greenville Christian County gets, gets about 10%. Uh, you can use them for a variety of things. You can use them to improve teacher quality, retention. Um, address class sizes, increase highly qualified teachers. The thing we use them for um, is professional development. So this past year and in future years, uh, we spent um, a large chunk of our Title IIA funds on the Summer Institute um, that you approved 
if you remember last spring, for the K-6 through literacy program. That was a significant chunk of that money. Um, but the, the remaining uh, that we had left is to support coaching for project-based learning and professional development coming up here in October uh, for our staff. We also use a little bit of those funds to cover in-house staff collaboration and PD. So the sub-funds don't come out of the, um, the district general fund, they come out of this Title II fund. Uh, but you're kind of limited in what those subs um, costs have to be related to PD and collaboration for the staff. And then the last one is Title IV. This is a brand new grant that just started last year. Um, this year our allocation is 13,000. Last year it was 10,000. And again, it's based on poverty and school <coughs> performance measures. So we get the minimum um, that you're going to get as a district in this particular area. This is a, a new one in terms of the state allowing for enrichment activities that complement school portal programs. You can look at literacy intervention. Um, you have a lot of flexibility in, in terms of how you can allocate these funds. Last year, we bought technology devices for the new K-6 Global Language Program that we not, would not have been able to afford uh, without these funds. Uh, this year, we have a lot of new teachers at the high school level that are teaching AP courses for the first time. Uh, to send a teacher to a summer institute uh, can cost a couple thousand dollars in some cases, depending on where uh, the institute's located. So, you know, we only can afford maybe one or two of those trainings a year. We really need to do three or four this year minimum at a minimum. And so we're going to use some of these funds for increased summer institute training for a couple of high school teachers. Um, and we're also going to um, allocate some of this money to support fine and performing arts at all grade levels. Uh, so that's the, the fine arts program, but also the, the music and performing arts programs as well. And that's all of my talk. I'm going to turn over to Gwen now. She's going to talk about Title III funds. Okay, so Title III funds are funds that we get from the federal government that are based on our accounts of students that we've identified as LEP or limited English proficiency by the state. So this past year we had, uh, this current year, I'm sorry, we had about 2,200 hours that we received uh, serving about 17 students. We are actually in a consortium with the um, Educational Service Center of Central Ohio because you have to have a minimum of $10,000 to be able to access your funds. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that. So we have to go into a consortium and the SCCO is our fiscal agent for that, and so all of our funds funnel through the ESCCO. We have access to uh, professional development. We have control over what we spend our local funds on, but some of the money is directed towards the ESCCO to support um, professional development, um, supplies, things on that lines uh, that we can send staff to. Um, and that money fluctuates every year. The amount's based on the number of LVP students that we have um, each year. And so uh, we've been in the consortium probably quite over Eight years now? Nine years? No, we went into a pack right after, maybe a year after I got here, so okay. probably about six. Six years? Okay. Yeah. Um, and we will continue to do that. I don't foresee our numbers getting to the point where we would hit a $10,000 threshold, so I don't see any reason why we wouldn't um, continue with, with um, the SCCO for that. The final part of our federal funds uh, come through for special education funding. Um, back in uh, when they passed the Public Law 94-142 back in the 70s, the federal government guaranteed 100% of the funding for special education services. I'll let that sink in for a second. 100% guaranteed funding of special education services. Our allocation last year was just over half a million dollars. Um, Mike can share with you the fact that that does not cover 100% of our special education funding, but it's what we get as the allocation for Part B. So like Ryan said earlier, there are parts of the federal um, budget that we have to uh, share with Rainbow Christian Academy. And so they um, elect to take their funds. They are electing for the first time this year to take the federal funds. They have typically turned those funds down in the past. This year it's a per child amount based on how many students they have with disabilities and the state determines that per share amount. It's not a funding amount that we determine. So based on the per share per amount, they have up to $28,000 to spend this year on providing services for students who have um, recognized IEP needs in their building. Um, we're still working through how we're going to spend those dollars. Um, and so this number comes from the number of special education students we had in fiscal year 2017. It's usually a two-year um, delay uh, on an October count. These only can be used for students with identified needs. So in our district, we have put um, everything in this dollar amount into staffing. So this covers about six and a half intervention specialists for us for the district. 
So then the other part is the early childhood funds that um, come through the federal government. And this is based on just the number of children that we have ages three to five who have been identified as having IEP needs. Um, because we have all of our preschool services, as you already know, go through the Dean County Educational Service Center, the dollars kind of flow right through us into them to help decrease and offset the cost, the cost for our um, preschool services. And so um, we don't have any other decisions to make about those dollars at this point. We just pull those right through the Dean County SC based on the numbers. So any questions about the public funds, either for what I oversee or for what Ryan oversees? I'd make one observation just from the standpoint of early intervention. Uh, we, we take an approach in a variety of different ways of trying to spend uh, these dollars at the lowest level possible uh, to get the greatest return long term. Um, because if you address intervention needs early, you don't have to spend money, more money later down the road addressing uh, additional deficits. So, uh, we, we are very intentional in taking that approach to early intervention. I would like, the one thing, especially with the IDEA funds, um, as opposed to the others where we have, you know, supplement, not supplant, we actually have through IDEA something called maintenance of effort, which means that we as a district cannot spend less on special needs students this year than we spent last year or we risk losing federal funds, unless we can demonstrably show we have fewer students meeting those needs. So as long as we are staying the same or growing, so even if, you know, if we're doing budget reductions and we have intervention specialists leaving, you know, this year we replaced it with two of them um, who left, and that's because we do not have a decrease in our population, and by not maintaining that effort, we actually can lose federal funds a little bit different mm -hmm. threshold than the supplement that's plan. The only other final thing I'd add is that, uh, as Glenn mentioned, the level of federal funding is a sliver mm -hmm. of the, the money that we spend on these programs. So it, it uh, by no means covers the entire cost. Can you estimate on a percentage basis what that five hundred plus thousand dollars? It, I'm trying to remember, the last time I was doing some of this work, which was about six months ago, um, I believe that the total amount that we spend on services that IDA money could be used for, not including the IDA money, was, it was either just under or just over $3 million. And that's, and that's not including the IDA money because we're not allowed to plan. And so in reality, we probably are spending about three and a half million dollars, um, of which the federal government is covering one seventh, which is just short of 100 percent if you do the math. <laughs> <laughs> Even I can figure that out. <laughs> Thank you. I just haven't paid much attention to the federal money. Not that it's not supporting an important thing, but just a small sliver of our, our budget. So, Mike, based on your kind of experience with other school districts and things like that. This is really driven by primarily uh, poverty needs, is that yeah. right? Or, or, and free resources, or, 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 yeah. as well as this, this student need. It depends on which so, federal program. The IDEA money is strictly on the number of students with disabilities. Okay. If, if we have a 1,000 <coughs> students, or not 1,000 a lot, if we have 300 students with disabilities mm -hmm. and another similar sized district that's a lot, less, well, let's say Whitehall, which is similar, mm -hmm. that's 300 students with disabilities, we're going to get similar Fun. levels of funding. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, but when you get to IDEA, and I'm sorry, not IDEA, Title I, <coughs> Title I is really driven by poverty. Okay. And so with us having a, you know, essentially a poverty rate of 5 or 6%, you know, we're going to get a lot less money than the district like Whitehall that may have a 60 or 65% poverty rate, and they're going to get probably at least six times the amount of money per kid that we get. Right. But in, in the services that are provided to the students are also controlled and needed through other legislation. So the cost side is something that would be similar with other districts? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. 
require the requirements are federal. There are also state requirements as well there on top of that, but we'll just talk, leave it at the federal requirements. <coughs> Thank you, thank you both very much. Okay, next we have our five year forecast from Mr. Matt Sol. Your forecast. Um, we'll start with in the same spot that we start normally taking a look at the current forecast compared to the forecast in May. Um, the one big difference you will see is because we are now in a new fiscal year, everything is rolled forward a year. And so in the top forecast, the October forecast, 2023 is now showing up, which it was not in the May forecast. The two circled areas, um, fiscal year 20 next year, and then fiscal year 22, and what you can see from those numbers is the forecast really has not changed um, all that much from the one that I did in May. Um, if you look at the cash balances at the end of next year, which are the black circle and lines, they're within $6,000 of each other from where they were in May. The red, the red colored line, um, circles and lines, that is the operating deficit um, we're still spent, yeah, we we're still in an operating deficit at, across the whole year, um, over all five years. And, but the, the amount hasn't changed that much. It's come down a little bit from about 2.5 to 2.3 million dollars in 2022. Um, that's primarily because um, our enrollment has picked up a little bit beyond what we were expecting back in May. And so it's been generating a little bit more state dollars. Um, through the formula because the one thing that, the, that it has done with the additional enrollment is we've been forecasting to be on the guarantee starting in 2020 and we've actually gained enough enrollment that we should not be guaranteed funding. Um, assuming this, the current formula is in place, um, we should be formula funding going forward, which means we will get some additional revenue. Like you'll see when we get to that part, it's not a ton of additional revenue that we'll be getting. Really, the main thing that you're know, looking at it is looking at the cash starting in 2022. You know, we have been projecting to have a $900,000 cash deficit, meaning we have negative cash in the bank, and at the end of 2022, that's come down by about $300,000 because, again, primarily the cumulative effects of the state aid and also some calibrating of the, um, the money that we're getting from the pay to participate. Um, which is a little bit stronger than we originally expected. What you can really see in the top graph when you get to the end of 2023, that 600,000 that is close to 4 million. That again, and this has no levy in it, we are not allowed to include the levy by law. Um, so this is without the aid of any levy, is yeah, by the end of 2023, if we did nothing, which obviously we can't do nothing because we can't run out of cash like that but we would be $4 million in a negative cash situation um, at the end of 2023 if everything just continued on as, a, as we're projecting right now with no additional um, revenues from a new level. Mike, can you talk about the uh, fact that we have cash on hand for the next two years and how that fits into the levy uh, structure that was decided on and why that's important. Yeah, that's important. And actually, we're going to see this really well in a, slide, in a couple slides. Um, where that's important is that, you know, because we've chosen the income tax route, that comes in much slower than the revenue from a property tax would come in. And so those cash balances are allowing us to have the income tax because we can wait for that slower phase to get there because we do have enough cash to continue operating. You know, what you can see is when we get at, if, if we don't do this this year, you see by the end of 2021, we're down to $1.7 million of cash. And the money comes in too slowly from the income tax to cover that shortfall um, that we're seeing at that 
or the less, not with the shortfall, but the lower amount of cash. Thank you. So that's why the timing is important in terms of yeah. the income tax levy as opposed to a property. Yeah, and that's why. And that's actually really clear in two, what happens in two, two slides down the way. Okay, the next thing we're going to take a look at is this is actually a 10 year forecast. Um, and again, this is with no new revenue and what the district would look like on 10 years from now. Obviously, you know, it's a lot of trending stuff because, you know, we have no idea in 2027 what, you know, what the situation, a lot of things are going to be. But if the current trends continue, what you see is out in 2028, we would have a cash deficit of over $30 million, which actually is the entire size of our budget right now. You know, our, our whole budget last year was $29 million. Um, and so, yeah, what we saw in the previous slide where we're at $4 million in the hole in 2023, that would continue to grow to over $30 million um, by 2028 if we don't do anything, which again, obviously, you know, we can't do that. Is there a point at which the state might come in, comes in and um, manages? Yes. Yeah. There is a three-step process called fiscal watch or fiscal caution, fiscal watch, fiscal emergency. Um, we are not in at, in, at, at risk of any of those right now. Um, if we do not get new revenue and don't take action to really, you know, what we need to deal with. Is if you look in 2020 we, or 21, we have that 1.4 million dollar operating deficit. If we're not dealing with that number, and two years out we're showing a negative cash balance, that would probably trigger a fiscal caution. If if a, if we get to 2021, we're still projecting a negative cash balance of 22, that would trigger a fiscal watch. And if we get into 2022 and are still projecting a negative cash balance that year, that would get us into fiscal emergency, at which point the state appoints an oversight board um, and they become essentially the legislative body and you as a board pretty much have to do what they tell, them, tell you they, that you have to do and they will take whatever actions they deem necessary to erase the negative cash balance. So that's kind of the progression. Which is, which is why we make the cuts we make so that we avoid. Correct. We push that back one year with the cuts we made. And if we don't get money by the end of this year, you know, we're going to have to do another series um, to address not only the $425,000 deficit we're expecting next year, but, you know, we have to start addressing the $1.4 million deficit that we would be expecting the year after that. Um, because you don't want to wait until that year to deal with because then the actions that would be taken are going to be much more severe than if you're dealing with it a year ahead of time. Okay, this, now what this is, this is the 10 year forecast again, but this is with assuming the passage of the income tax. Um, and to get to Russ's point, if you look at kind of the middle row there where it says proposed new levies, and you can see if this passes in November, in fiscal year 19, so the year we're in right now, we're only going to get $290,000 of income tax revenue, and we will still spend more than we're taking in this year um, because part of the program is to move some inside millage to deal with our capital, and a part of the inside millage would get moved this year. Um, and so we would still actually be operating at a small deficit this year, even with the income tax passing. What you can see is we would start operating at a surplus in 2020, in 2020 uh, bringing in more revenue than we would be spending. And that would continue for through the end of this forecast period, 2023. And again, what we anticipate with, it, with the current assumptions about spending and revenue. So, yeah, we haven't done anything to replace the positions that we lost. We haven't done anything with pay to participate. 
basically nothing horribly goes wrong with our infrastructure that is causing us to do something that we don't want to have to do in the next five years that we're not planning to do in the next five years. We would have about nine and a half million dollars um, of cash um, on hand. But then you can see, starting in 2024 grants, this is a long way into the future, a lot can change. But with the current trending, we would start drawing that back down again. Um, where, you know, even with the income tax, our revenues would not be keeping up with inflation um, and our costs. But if you look all the way out to 2027, nine years from now, um, we would still have $2 million of cash in the bank. Um, and again, this is what we've been talking about, a uh, much longer term sustainability. Um, you know, the history in the district has been about every five years we have to come back for new money um, because of property tax and ability to grow. And so this does provide a more sustainable, longer term um, opportunity. Um, and yeah, and the district can you know manage towards that as we get towards the latter parts of that, hopefully to extend it beyond the period um, that we have here. But on the other hand, there are other risks that can happen that we can't predict right now um, that could do, move, make us go the other direction. But this is this is what we look like in the long run, in the longer run, um, with the new. Any questions about that before I go ahead and move on? So what would a, a future potential levy be in addition to the income tax when it is renewed? Presumably sometime out in that 2026 to 28 period, depending on obviously a lot of factors between now and 2026 that I think I wouldn't begin to try and forecast what that, those might be. Um, and I, I would guess that somewhere in that, somewhere in that range. But this model still uh, aligns with the natural flow for levies in Ohio, where you build up a cash balance and then you spend down over right. time. It's just a longer period of time. It, it's a very similar. Uh, for the but, but the real difference with the property tax in this is because of the potential growth in the income tax. And you can see I do have a couple percent growth built in each year um, to the revenue going forward. Because of that natural growth, we have the potential in any given year to get maybe even get enough growth out of the income tax, you know, if certain things go right with spending that we may go long, a longer period of time without deficit, deficit spending because at least we now have some potential um, to, get, to get growth. But again, to put that in perspective, the amount of money that we're talking about here, um, again, if you look out at 2023, 2024, you're talking about five, five and a half million dollars out of a, what would then be a $35 million budget. So again, it's only one seventh. So essentially, it will give us ability to grow, but it's only giving us ability to grow on one seventh of the revenue that we get. You know, our primary source of revenue is still going to be property tax. And that still has all the issues with not being able to grow, which is why, even with the extended, the extension and the ability for this to grow, the expenses are catching up to the revenue growth again because it's only one seventh of our revenues that are growing with inflation. I mean, that's way better than what we have now, but it's still only one seventh. Okay, um, taking a look at where we are cash wise, um, yeah, we, have, we do have a cash balance guidelines that the board approved a few years ago 10% um, of the current year's operating revenue, um, which right now is about two point, a little under two point nine million dollars, um, and that's the green line. The green line is going across is the balance. The balance. The goal is to remain above the line. What you can see is, over the next two years, with the exception of the next two Januarys, we are at or above that line. But what you also see is, if you look at June 
uh, where the green bar is 3.7 in 2019, and then you look at June at the end of 2020, we are getting awfully close to that cash balance line. Um, you also see in January of 2020, that $800,000 at the end of January maybe could cover a payroll. Maybe. Um, is about one payroll worth of money. So we are, you know, we're getting back, back to a situation like we were in five years ago um, when we were getting to the end of January um, hoping we did not have to go to the bank to borrow money to make payroll until the property taxes started coming in. Um, and so that's part of the problem. You can see from June of this year to January, there's about a $2.9 billion swing in our cash um, in that period. And that's really where we need to keep the eye on is the bottom part of the cycle, not where we happen to be on June 30th. Taking a look at our enrollment, um, you can see the, what, with the graph that we peaked in enrollment in 2010, all the growth that happened through the 2000s, through the developments in park trails and other places. Um, and then coming out of the housing market crash, um, we actually lost about 140 students over about a five year period. We bottomed in the 2014-15 school year and have now begun climbing back up again. Um, if you look at the projections based on what we've been seeing, in the, the school year that starts next, it's, it's hard to believe it, the school year that starts next July, we are expecting to have our enrollment back to where it was in 2010. So we, are, so we will recover those 140 students by next school year, and you can see that beyond that, we're projecting another 30 or so um, students on top of that by the time we get out to 2023. Um, so, yeah, we're <clears throat> essentially with that point, we'll run every year but one. Uh, we are expecting a small drop in 2021 because the birth data is indicating that um, we have a small kindergarten class. And that senior class from 2020 is the largest class that we have in the district going now. So we'll have the largest class going out followed by a smaller kindergarten, or what we expect to be a smaller kindergarten class coming in. And that's accounting for the one drop um, that we're expecting to see over the next five years. But generally an upward trend. But that could change if we see a lot of movements. <clears throat> it's, well, it's assuming a pattern of movement is likely. Okay. I mean, that's built into this. I mean, that's, that's what's true. driving this is, you know, we usually get a net from mobility, we call mobility, which is people coming in relative to those moving out. We usually get anywhere from 70 to 90 new students that way. What keeps our overall enrollment from growing 70 to 90 students is that typically our kindergarten classes are roughly 50 to 70 kids smaller than the outgoing senior class. And so, yeah, we're jumping 70 to 90, but we're losing 50 to 70 from that, which is why we're getting that slow, steady growth instead of, you know, a much more rapid upward trajectory. Taking a look at our revenues, um, looking back three years, looking forward three years, um, Right now, about 62% of the total operating revenues of the district is coming from real property taxes. When you add in property tax allocation, the orange slice part of the bottom, which is tied to the property tax, it's just the state reimbursements. We're really getting 70% of our revenue driven by our property tax right now. Um, we're getting about 23% of our revenue from state aid that has even though we've been getting more state aid that has been dropping as a percentage of our revenue, and we expect it to drop another percentage point going forward again, even though if we're going to be getting a little bit more, it's still a small part of, of what we've been getting. Um, you see the jump in our other revenue, you know, from three years ago from 2% to now 4%. That is the impact of pay to participate. Um, and 
the impact of us where we over the last couple of years we've added additional all day kindergarten classes with tuition both of those revenue sources going down the revenue and that's why that um, is growing you see it started actually flattens out going forward because we're not anticipating adding any more all day kindergarten classes although that's probably something we're going to have to keep an eye on um, and um, the paid up participants will get the bump but then it stays um, fairly flat. Okay, um, we've seen this slide before. Um, last year, 2017, was a reappraisal year in Licking County. Um, you can see in the highlighted areas just below the middle, um, our residential properties at the reappraisal went up by 14% across the district. Our agricultural properties went down from more than one. Um, but because of how the tax system works and the tax reduction factors, that 14% increase in values yielded about 1.5% growth in revenues. And that was actually three years worth of growth. Um, so in reality, that generated a half percent a year in growth in revenues for three years uh, because of the way the system works. 2020 will be a triennial update here, here in Lincoln County. At this point, um, yeah, we don't have a whole lot of data that's moving into that yet. Um, and at this point, we're looking at a 6% increase in, value, in home values in um, 2020. Even if it's a little more, it really is not going to generate much additional revenue because the tax, it just means the tax rates will get rolled back further um, and, we'll really, and we'll just get growth on our inside millage. So again, we're probably on a 6% growth, we're probably going to get maybe three quarters of a percent growth in revenue on a 6% growth in valuations um, in 2020. Mike, I think that might be the single most um, misunderstood concept in this community, and maybe statewide, is that you know people assume that when their property taxes go up, they assume that the schools get more revenue. And, and until you go through the conversation about House Bill 920 and the reduction factors, uh, people don't really understand that we do not get that same commensurate level of growth in revenue. As a matter of fact, it's 0.5% per year. And, um, and it took a 14% increase to get us right. that 0.5% growth a year. Exactly. And, and I think that is a, a point that we want to make sure people understand um, through this process. And that's also, you know, when I talked a little bit ago about, you know, only one-seventh of our revenue growing with inflation, this is still going to be the major source of revenue, and it maybe, if we're lucky, will grow a quarter to a half a percent a year going forward from gross and values. And so that's a pretty anemic growth rate for your largest source of revenue that's funding. So, so there's a lot of people, again, that like to bring up, oh, my house value went up so much, right? And they talk about how their taxes went up so much with the appraisal. If their taxes went up, there's probably somebody else whose taxes went down. Correct. Because on average, right, the amount of taxes paid through property taxes at the school only went up 1.5% a year. Right. right. For three years. Right. Yeah. So, so, year. so, so you hear from a lot of people that say my taxes went up, but you don't hear a whole lot from the people that say my taxes went down a lot. That's correct. They but they're tend, out there. They tend not to complain because they assume it was a mistake. They don't want someone to find a mistake. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, they, you don't hear from them very often. Yeah. Taking a look at our state funding, um, you look, you know, when we looked at this back in May, almost every year was in the oranges, tannish, or salmon, whatever that color is at the top, because we're on the guarantee. Um, we are now projected to be on the formula each year. I mean, that's good and that's bad. Well, it's good. I mean, it, you know, ideally, every school district should be on a formula, not on a guarantee or on a cap. Um, the challenge with being on the formula is that everything matters. Um, so you add a kid, you get more money. You lose a kid, you get less money. Um, value's moving, makes you wealthier, you get less money. So everything matters in the forecast now. Um, but again, I think that's a good thing, um, that we are formula funded, and I would love to see more districts formula funded, and I'm hoping if we get a new funding system, almost all districts will be formula funded, would, would be the hope. 
one of the uh, one other issue with this state funding formula is if you look back in the last two years, we have gone from a guaranteed district to a cap district to a formula district. So that variability, sometimes that happens within a year. Uh, so I think it is really important to understand that, that the volatility of the state funding formula is real. Yeah, last year we started the Earth Formula District and finished it as cap district because we added 25 kids as the year went on and the first portion of those were enough to get us up to the cap. Once we hit the cap, the additional kids we got, we got no additional money for uh, because we got the cap of the most we were allowed to grow um, under the funding rules. Um, take, again, putting some of this in perspective, um, if you take a look at our state aid between 2010 and 2017, on a per pupil basis, we got a 3.2% increase over seven years, which is less than half a percent a year. And so again, this is our second largest source of revenue. It is growing at about the same half percent a year on a per pupil basis as our largest source of revenue is growing, which explains why our expenditures are growing faster than our revenues. Uh, because the two largest sources are not growing. Looking forward at the projected age, you do see we do you see those those graphs are getting bigger each year. It's a little hard to see that because they're not getting a lot bigger. Other than in the last year, I mean we're looking at a little bit of a jump to last year, and so we're looking at a 3.2 percent increase in dollars over a five-year period. But we're also expecting 3.4 percent enrollment increase. Which actually means over the next five years, even though we're getting more money on a per pupil basis, we're about staying flat. We're actually mo very, very modestly declining on a per pupil basis over the next five years. Um, and that is getting growth in revenue. That is actually getting more revenue from the state every year, but we are not getting enough growth to keep up with even the modest enrollment growth um, that we're seeing. Um, last piece, I did want to talk a little bit, you know, we talked about the need for capital um, and, and what this looks like. What this is, this is a look at starting with the 16-17 school year, taking a look at our sources for the capital budget, um, where that revenue comes from, and then kind of what our future needs are um, to meet our 20-year plan. And that, in this example, we are assuming that the PI levy would renew. Obviously, the plan is if the income tax passes, we will not renew that. This is what it would look like if, again, if we stayed as everything is right now. And what you can see, um, the capital maintenance levy, um, the, second, the second column of data, the year we are in right now is the final year of full collection of that. Um, that levy ends at the end of 2019. It cannot be renewed. Um, we will get a half year of revenue in the 1920 school year, and we will get nothing beyond that. The next column, the Park Trials Assessment, um, what you can see there is we peak in the 2019-20 school year at about $165,000. Um, starting that next year, the 2021 school year, there are some of the homes are gonna start hitting the 20-year mark and not having to pay. And what you see happens is in the first five years, we dropped from $165,000 of revenue to $70,000 of revenue. You know, over half the revenue goes away. And honestly, if I carried this through one more year, a big chunk of that 70 would go away the, the year after that. Because that, that, that's the first half of the last big year of construction is what starts going off in 24, 25. And so what you can see the total revenue, and then starting with next year, the far right, col the far right column is what our capital budget is if we were able to fund what we need to fund. And you see, even in 1920, when we were well, about a $600,000 shortfall, and that shortfall getting bigger as, or at least staying at the 600,000 range and getting bigger every year. And, and if you think about the cumulative effect of that and what that's doing to our maintenance 
is essentially what that what this is saying is that every essentially two years we're missing a year we're every three years we're missing a year a full year of maintenance is what this essentially means under, under this yeah this look forecast of what this looks like um, without the influx that we would get from what we're planning to do if the income tax passes and that doesn't that doesn't include any allowance for unforeseen expenses like we had this year with the uh, fire sprinkler safety That's system. That's correct. Which is another $300,000. Right. Because budget. this year, essentially, what we had to do was everything we were planning to do mechanically, we had, because we, where we lost the levy, we had to outpay all of that to the sprinkler system and not do any of the other mechanical stuff that we were hoping to do this year and that the 20 year plan said we should do this year. So to, to be Put a really fine point on it that far category future capital plan needs is really maintenance and replacement of uh, equipment that, that is expected to exceed its useful life at some point. It doesn't include any capital for building projects or new construction or Correct. anything anything other than maintaining what we have. Correct, including um, replacing buses and technology. I mean, that's all part of that. Sure as well as the building infrastructure. Well, and what I'd like to highlight is the fact that, you know, it, when you see, you've identified the future capital plan needs, but we have been deferring maintenance from, uh, you know, the 16, 17 school year, 17, 18, 18, 19. There's an accumulation of deferred maintenance that is also backlogged, um, that is trying to be addressed on top of some of that future capital need as well. Uh, because we have been underfunding that capital plan by about $500,000 annually for a while. So you're just addressing the future gap, but there's also uh, deferred maintenance that needs to be recovered. Yeah. Okay, and that's the right central revenue side of the forecast, the expenditure side. Um, you take a look, and again, not surprisingly, as, we, as we've been through, about 80% of what we spend is on salary and benefits. Another 15% is on purchase services. Um, you will see the purchase service share has gone from 14% three years ago to 15. Now we're projecting to go to 16 in another three years. That is probably the fastest growing area of our budget. Um, and a lot of that is instructional needs and unfunded mandates. Things that whatever they are, we are required, whether it's state law, federal law, to spend the amount of money it takes to meet those needs. Um, taking a look at the five, the last five years, looking back and looking forward, um, overall, um, we're spending the last five years grew by about 5% a year. Um, the biggest area is being purchase services and benefits. You know, benefits primarily healthcare purchase services. What we just talked about. Uh, you can see this year the one percent, one tenth of one percent drop. Essentially, are, we're staying about flat in our personnel spending. Um, that is a result of the reductions in force and the other positions that we left vacant um, when when they opened up. Um, and then the benefits are dropping 6%, which is a combination of both the reductions and the work that we've done working with the association on controlling health care. And those are the premium drops for the health care change that we're seeing the biggest impact of this year. Going forward, what we're anticipating is a 3% annual increase. Um, Obviously, the changes this year are having a big impact on that um, when you put in one year of zero um, on, the, uh, on the salaries and a drop in the benefits. You still see purchase services growing faster than salaries um, through the whole period um, because of the issues. Um, the capital numbers look, look kind of aligned to keep in mind we only spend about $30,000 a year. And so, and last year, I think we only ended up spending about 18, so like $249,000, or 249% uh, is very little in the way of money. Um, 
and you know, the rest of the stuff is just, you know, mostly smaller items in the project. Um, taking a look at other um, efficiency actions that we have taken, um, in addition to the positions that we riffed at the end of the school year, over the past year we have had 11 staff members um, leave the district. Um, again, not including the reduction because of the levy failure. You know, the annualized cost of those 11 staff members was almost $600,000. On those 11 positions, we are now spending $318,000, right? a savings of $277,000. Part of that is because almost half of those positions were not refilled. Um, they, when they became vacant, we did not refill them. And you know, two of the positions that were refilled were special education related. And as I explained earlier with the maintenance of effort, we don't have a decrease in our students, uh, students with needs, so we had to fill those positions um, when, they, when they came over. Taking also just a look at our um, administrators and our, you know, our administration, um, you know, people say, well, why, you know, why can't you cut administration? If you take a look at this for the 16-17 school year, this is benchmarked against our most similar districts. You can see that we're the kind of grayish color at 177 students per administrator, which is above the average, and that's good to be above the average. <laughs> above the average means you have more students per administrator. And keep in mind, this is before the elimination of the assistant principal position um, through the RIF. And also keep in mind, because of that, in the elementary school right now, we have one administrator and 712 students. Under the age of 10. Under the age of 10. And in the intermediate school, we have 581 students with one administrator working in that village. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm making it a little hard to say, well, that's too many administrators. Final thoughts. Um, you know, basically our fiscal challenges haven't changed. They've just been put off a year um, through the reduction in, through the reduction in tours and the, um, imp the implementation of part pay to participate. Um, obviously from the long slide, the capital needs cannot be funded in the longer run without additional revenue. I mean, we see the shortfalls. Um, and when you look at it, if, if we don't pass this levy or a levy in May, if it comes to that, um, if we don't get additional revenue, really by the end of this year, we have to deal with not only the $400,000 deficit we're facing next year, but we're going to have to deal with the $1.4 million deficit for the year after that, because I think at that point, the community will have told us, no, we want you to operate with the revenue that you have available. And that means addressing the $1.4 million shortfall um, and not just the $400,000 shortfall. Any final questions?
but also other essential pillars to a quality education. To that end, our organization voted unanimously at our September 19th meeting to support this ballot issue. Please include the Granville Arts Booster's name moving forward as is appropriate with other supporters. We thank you and the Arts Boosters for that public support. That is very uh, gratifying and we appreciate it. Brian Costa, uh, 2324 Business Court. I'm here on behalf of the Rural Organization District, uh, to which I'm a trustee, uh, actually a school board trustee. So. Um, same thing with the Grandville uh, Recreation District. Uh, we passed a resolution to uh, unanimously support the school district and their uh, levy efforts as well. Uh, we realize you guys as a strategic, par strategic partner, um, you know, we cooperate a lot with you guys. You guys, uh, the board does a great job at overseeing the tax dollars. Uh, and we find that uh, we were in full support of uh, all levy efforts. We appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the GRT. Hello, my name is Gary Mann, I'm with Five Nine House Lane, Granville. I had uh, two separate questions. One is, uh, I was at a village council meeting, helps you die, I have nothing to do with my life. I <laughs> and, uh, at the meeting, there was a, a proposal by an architect for development on Newark Granville Road of uh, 30 plus homes. Um, uh, just across from Brent at the colony. There. My concern was uh, he made a specific point of stating that uh, Mr. Sobel in the Granville schools was in support of that development. Um, that he had come here, talked with the uh, Mr. Sobel about the development, and he classified the home as the development as uh, empty nester homes. But there's no deep restrictions. There's no. Uh, these are 2,200 square foot homes. Uh, easily built into three uh, bedroom homes or more. Um, and I, I just don't, my concern is that I, I think we get into a bad area if we, we start having the schools supporting or not supporting um, developments in the area, especially residential, uh, when you know, our major concern is commercial development. And uh, I was concerned, that, you know, so I want to make sure, first off, in this world of fake news and, and everything else that goes along with that, if that, if that was in fact the case, that, that you, uh, the Granville Schools is uh, supporting developments now, or officially going behind and supporting developments? Yeah. We can address that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, okay. <laughs> it was Jerry Bird that helped you out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, number two, uh, it has to do with the levy. You know, I was up here after the last levy, and I had mentioned uh, to, to the, you know, I've worked on several levies, and one thing I've always, you know, said is. You're going to have yeses, you're going to have a no's. If you got to give it away the independence, um, the reason to say no. And, and I think um, one of the things that hasn't come through in, in all the literature, both positive and negative, is, is what you've done to um, improve the, the financial uh, uh, budgeting in the schools, for example. Until tonight, I had not heard that there was a reduction in, in overall personnel uh, in the schools from you know, net exchange, I guess, of loss of four. Um, uh, the only news I've uh, read is uh, we, we had the reduction in force after the last levy, and then we, we had in the newspaper the hiring of the three personnel, which included the uh, football coach. Um, so to me, that's not necessarily net, net, much of a net exchange, but I think you have to get more of the, uh, not necessarily levy material, you have to get about the positive you're doing as far as uh, expense control. And uh, anyways, that's. That's it for me. I just want to make sure I share that. Uh, appreciate the comment. Thank, Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, with that, we will close the public comment section of our agenda. Thank you for your comments. And then move into board discussion, which uh, uh, we have indicated tonight will be around the levy. I think it's uh, it's also appropriate and useful to respond to, to both of the uh, areas that, that um, the guy suggested the um, questions on. So can I, can yeah, I sure. start with That's the, the last question first? Sure. So um, what, what Mike presented on as far as the 
loss of FTE, I think what you missed is that was beyond the reduction in force. So if you look at what our payroll was, who, how many people we paid in uh, April of 2018, and then in August, it's about 11 less in aggregate. No, that's what I'm saying. I hadn't yeah. heard that, and that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's the kind of right. news I think would be helpful. Yes, and so, so in aggregate, it's 11. That's with replacements, and what we try and do is anytime we have someone uh, leaving the organization, we try and hire at a lower level so that we realize some cost savings through that process. Um, and that is true um, that we've been doing that practice ever since I've been here. But, but yeah, the net FTE decline is, is 11. And that's a combination of the six positions we eliminated, which were not refilled, uh, and other positions where there were voluntary retirement resignations and what have you. And as, as Mr. Brown indicated, some of them we filled at a lower level and some of them we did not fill. So that's the clarification of that. To be absolutely clear, we have not refilled any of the positions that, uh, that were eliminated following the, uh, the May election. Um, on the commercial development piece, and I, I don't want to speak for, for Mr. Sobel, I will tell you that the board has taken a position for the last number of years um, of advocating locally for uh, for commercial development, which will which will help with economic sustainability in the community and help to, uh, to build up some of the commercial revenues that, that come in and can offset or ease the burdens on residents in this community because it's out of balance. Uh, it's, in most communities statewide, it's about 75% residential and 25% commercial. In Granville, it's 90-10. And it's simply because we have a small commercial base here. So we've advocated openly, actively, and consistently for some commercial development. We're almost always consulted when a uh, new proposal comes in for residential development, whether it's been the case of apartments, uh, whether it's in the case of single family homes or, um, or condominiums or the like, we're almost always consulted on that uh, and asked to give our views on that um, with respect to how it would impact um, uh, our student population, our expenses, our capacity to absorb, um, and and so, and again, I don't want to speak for Mr. Sobel, but, but what I can tell you, generally, um, on a 30-unit uh, housing proposal, and I, I fully agree with you, as far as I understand, there's no, no deed restriction there that says it's limited to seniors or retirees, or number. but we would not expect to generate significant students out of that, uh, out of that development, and so it would not impact us negatively in terms of um, population, in terms of ability to absorb those students within, uh, within our existing facilities, and it would uh, in all likelihood be a net positive in terms of revenues that come to the school district uh, that are generated you know, by students who attend the schools. Is that fair? Yeah, um, yeah Mr. Bird did come in to talk to me, um, and I took a look at it, and really what they were talking about is something that is very much like the colony. Uh, across the street. Right now in the colony there are 43 units and we have two kids of those 43 units. Um, they are a similar structure of what they are building, two bedrooms um, <coughs> with a loft and the same type of structure and based on the design, based on the similar to the colony, um, I did not feel that we were at great risk for a lot of students because of the history we have with the colony. So, you know, conversely, there was a proposal that we batted around earlier this year to build 200 apartment units within the community. And we expressed concern over that uh, because we, we, in our forecast, we thought that would put significant pressures on our capacity. In aggregate, we watched that uh, the number of new home starts or potential developments uh, with a fine tooth comb because, you know, right now, uh, there is the potential for uh, close to 100 new home starts in, in some of the existing developments. And so we are always looking at that and at least giving our opinion um, to the planning commission of uh, both the township and, and uh, the village. And so um, we try and opine and look at the data that, that from a similar type of development and, and give that information to the planning commission for their ultimate decision. 
decision. Anybody else comments on that? Um, well, then, um, there's this thing that we have coming up in November. <laughs> uh, as everyone knows, I hope, we placed a 0.75 all income tax levy on the ballot in November. We did so after uh, obviously um, having our, our 1.25 earned income tax levy proposal uh, not pass in the May election, and after which we undertook a number of steps, first of which was to um, reduce headcount, eliminate significant positions, uh, positions that uh, we consider to be important and meaningful in, um, in the lives of our students, uh, and not something that we took lightly, but we, we did so in order to make sure that our budget was balanced going forward. Um, we've also looked for other opportunities, as we've discussed, to reduce expenses and reduce headcount where possible to do so as we have done for the last number of years. Uh, we then uh, invited the community in to um, conduct four different public sessions, public comment sessions. Uh, we invited folks in to give us their perspective on uh, what they liked about the schools, what they liked about the community, what their, what their thoughts were with respect to school funding. Because it, it's important to note here that we're, as Mr. Sobel indicated in his uh, five-year forecast. This is not a question of levy or no levy. Uh, it's a question of what kind of levy. Uh, and if it becomes a question of no levy, then, then it, the issue is significant material cuts to schools as we know them. Uh, and so we, we solicited input. We received tremendous, um, a tremendous amount of interest from folks in the community. Lots of suggestions, lots of input, uh, lots of comments about various uh, options available to us, earned income, all income, property tax, and ultimately um, the board made a determination after receiving all of that uh, uh, input from the community and, and we put that 0.75 all income tax levy on the ballot. Uh, that, uh, in, in the information campaign uh, with respect to that levy is being conducted by a dedicated uh, group of volunteers from the community um, the board is not allowed to run a campaign, uh, and we don't. We all, I think, obviously uh, believe in, in that levy because we voted to put it on, on the ballot for the community, but we can't run a campaign. So that work is being done by just uh, a number of volunteers who are giving up so much of their time and their talent and treasure to support that effort and inform the community. And it's, you know, nights like this one when, we, when it becomes apparent to us that we, you know, that's a never-ending job uh, in putting information out to the community so that folks know uh, that we've, we've been responsive, we've been uh, prudent, we've made cuts where necessary, we need to continue to, to be accountable stewards of the community's resources while at the same time doing everything we can to place the best interests of the kids in this community, the students, at the highest level of priority. Um, and so that's the, that's the uh, the job between now and uh, first Tuesday in November, um, and I know we, uh, I know many of you, all of you, have uh, perspectives and views on that. So I, I don't want to keep talking here. I want somebody else to. I I'd like to highlight um, something that we intentionally included into the uh, five-year forecast, which was going back to that administrative um, number of administrators per pupil. Um, and we put the information up there related to the fact that you know, we had an assistant principal that split between um, the elementary and the intermediate. That position was eliminated. And, and I, I think it is important for the community to understand that we have one administrator with 710 kids under the age of 10. And yes, we have a lot of uh, teachers to support the educational needs, um, but that that is um, not an easy task. As a former elementary principal of a large elementary and I have an assistant, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have that. Um, but the, uh, the other thing that we, we did do is you know, we eliminated the communications position. Um, what, what I think is important to recognize is we are 
kind of a bigger communicator for the broader community. Uh, people would send us information and we would distribute that out. And, and we've had many people say, you know, well, why aren't you sending out any information now? Well, because we're sending out our information only. And, and that's what we have the capacity to do right now because that, is, that uh, requirement now was placed back on the administration, the building administration or, or uh, administrators like Mr. Burnett and myself. Uh, so there is a tangible loss of resource and a tangible loss of service that is associated with those administrative cuts. And I, I, I hear, you know, I live in this community, and I hear, oh, there's, there's too many administrators. And I don't think people are informed about how many administrators actually are in this district. And I can tell them from my experiences in many other school districts that that is absolutely a false statement. So that's why that slide was in, in the presentation. Um. I think the levy committee is doing a fantastic job. There's just a lot more energy around this levy. There's a lot of people that really got motivated and got shocked into action based on the failure of the last levy. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by the positive work they're doing. But really, it comes down to like personal conversations, right? It comes down to like being willing to talk to your neighbor and ask them whether they have any questions and encourage them to get the answers, right? Because anybody that asks the questions and is willing to listen to the answers, like almost unanimously becomes a supporter, right? People that haven't thought enough to ask those questions, right, or haven't taken the time, right, might be confused about how many administrators we have, or how much we're spending on things, or, or you know, what the impact of state funding is, and so forth. Right? I think we've done an enormous amount of work and homework to kind of come up with the structure, and I firmly believe it's the right thing moving forward. It's really, really the right thing that our district needs to do. But it's a lot of individual conversations that need to happen between between all of us in the community to kind of make sure that this is supported going forward. But kudos to Levy Team for all that they are doing because it's really moving forward nicely. No, I agree that um, if, I mean, if anybody has questions, call us. Call the, you know, anybody because all the information is there. It's all public. It's all out there. Um, we even had people come in and look at our books after the last failure, failure, and there were no suggestions on, you know, to do anything differently than what we have done before. So, you know, books are wide open. Books are online. The checkbook, um, you can see everything that we're spending. So there's no secret. And so I encourage people to, you know, if you don't know what an administrator does, give us a call. Ask us what they do. Because some of our administration we have because the state mandates that we report out information, and therefore we have to dedicate an administrator just to reporting information to the state. So um, I think, you know, I've learned a lot just being on board. So um, if you're at all interested or, you know, or not interested but want to know, I mean, we're all here, that's why we're here. So please call us, email us. Um, happy to provide you any information that we can. It's all public, it's all available. Well, I, I was just going to say that. I really appreciate that our partners like the Granville Rec District, of which um, I served as a trustee, I mean, not speaking for them, but as a former trustee, we, the, the Rec District truly appreciates the partnership that they have with the school districts. Um, there would be, I, I'd be hard pressed to say we'd be allowed to offer as many programs as uh, as Granville Rec does if it wasn't for the partnership, which I don't think a lot of people know. Um, we have free access to the to the buildings. There, there's not a there's not a charge. There's not a rental fee, and we have a great working relationship. Uh, and and like and as with the art boosters, it, it's good to see that our partners out there appreciate what, what the district does. And I do appreciate Mr. Mando's comments about what needs to be promoted. Um, I appreciate that. I think it's important that folks in the community let us know maybe what we're not promoting enough of um, or what we need to, to, to let people know what we have done. And I think to echo what Mr. Miller and Mr. Janice said, the levy committee is doing an outstanding job. 
those volunteers are committed. There's a there's a passion there, and um, it it can be it, it it's a lot of a lot of time that they're volunteering um, on behalf of all our kids. Uh, to say and to say thank you is is not near enough because of the commitment they're making to our school district. So I re I really appreciate that. I'm sure I know the whole board and the administration and staff do as well. because we believe that it actually benefits them academically. And uh, so some of the other things that they provide uh, help offset some revenue that we would spend, but a million dollars annually to support the arts is an intentional decision by this board that says that's what a well-rounded education is. And, and I think that point should be made. The other part, and, and Fred touched on it, the GRD and the Granville Schools are strategic partners. What that means is we intentionally look at our budgets and say, how can we maximize taxpayer dollars and resources to not have them spend more? So where a lot of government entities compete with one another, we work together to benefit all the taxpayers in Granville and provide a level of service that our taxpayers enjoy because of that partnership. And we don't look at turf, you know, meaning who's, whose pot of money is this and whose pot of money is that. It's about how do we share resources to provide the max benefit to students and this community. And it's beyond just the students. They provide a lot of other services that are hosted in Granville schools that um, provide opportunities for growth for all ages of community or Granville residents. And I, I want to highlight the intentional side of that strategic partnership because I think that's what good government does. So for example, we don't charge, as Fred pointed out, direct district to use our athletic facilities because frankly they'd be paying for it with tax dollars that they they collect from local residents. I don't think that's appropriate. They repay us in other ways. They'll, they'll take responsibility for cutting the grass, maintaining the fields, maintaining facilities, and doing things like that that saves us money as well. So I think you're, you're spot on, Mr. Brown. The, uh, this is a partnership that really shows the united effort to maximize the community's resources in order to provide the best opportunities available. 
Look, as I said, it's not an option, it's not a question of levy or no levy, it's a question of which levy or massive cuts. Right? And as Mr. Sobel's presentation indicated, 80% of our expenses are on human capital. Right? We don't buy a lot of raw materials. We spend money on people, on people that, that teach kids, that protect kids, that work with kids, that coach kids. And so, to the extent that cuts, more cuts, are required, it will be cuts to people, which, you, which changes class size, it changes program offerings, it changes uh, experience levels, it changes the academic experience for our kids. And I know, Jeff, you, you've been fond of saying, you, you repeated the story that when you went to the reception earlier this year for new parents in the district, you asked for a show of hands how many people moved here because of the schools, and everybody raised their hands. We do for less and achieve superior results. And those results are available, as Dr. Corman said, for everybody to see. Our average expenditure per pupil is below uh, districts that we outperform by a mile. We do for less. If there's no big savings to be had here, cuts will be significant if they're made. In any event, I will, uh, unless anyone else has any, has any questions, I will, again, uh, on behalf of the board, thank the folks who are spending all of their time and effort away from their families, their jobs, and other things, and devoting uh, their time and talent and treasure to, to promoting the Levy campaign, to informing the community. I know that my colleagues and I uh, cannot thank you enough for that. So we'll close the uh, board discussion and move into board reports. Great. I'll start with a quick update on uh, some news from the Grantville Education Foundation. This year is uh, GEF's 25th anniversary. So there will be uh, just some celebrations around that and some campaigning and we'll hopefully raise some additional funds and uh, draw attention to all the great things that GEF does. Um, and so expect more from that over the coming year. The board is energized and it's a great thing for folks to do that. And it's not officially on the agenda, but I'm going to give you a quick update on the Granville Township Pathways Committee, uh, which I've served. Um, they have completed a survey that is now live. And so I wanted to ask uh, Jeff and the district to go ahead and start publishing that through our channels. The goal is to get feedback from, from parents uh, at all the different buildings as well as others in the community about what they value about uh, walkability and bikeability and sidewalks and access to schools. And so there's been a great survey that's been designed to help gather that information that will steer the township in terms of decisions on which pathways to pursue and ensuring we get funding from state uh, sources and other places to, to support that. So that's out there, and I will make sure you email if you don't have it already uh, from that committee so we can publicize that for our various channels, you know, this will be, you know uh, newsletters, and yeah. ways to so forth. Yeah, so. we, what we can do is post a link on our website. We can also uh, promote it through the Blue Ace News. Do you, do you know when that survey is coming down? I think we've chosen to leave it up for four weeks. Okay. So uh, is our next release of news goes out the, the 17th. Okay. Would that be adequate? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. But make sure it gets in the school ones as well. Yes. Ones. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. We'll get those out to me first. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And it's fantastic. The you know, Ed Foundation, 25 years. Yeah. Of folks who mm -hmm. go out and, and fill the gaps mm -hmm. and, uh, and contribute money to the programs that make a difference that can allow teachers to do some of the extra special things in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak on economic sustainability. There are really two things I want to mention. First, and, and it was timely that Mr. Manos mentioned the, the board and the district's involvement in some community development activities. Um, there's a proposal that many of you may have seen for development of a medical office building uh, on Newark Granville Road, just off of Newark Granville Road down by Thornwood Crossing. Um, we have looked at that. We would certainly encourage um, that project to move forward. We think it will, obviously, it's not going to put any uh, strain on our ability to absorb new students, and um, it will add to the commercial tax base, uh, add a service that we think would be useful in the community and appropriate for the community, uh, and we think it's a net positive, and we'd love to see that happen. Um, the other thing I will mention, and, and Mr. Brown has really taken the laboring war on this. Um, there is a joint effort between the Granville um, Village Council, the uh, Township Trustees, 
Board of Education with participation from Denison and others uh, to work on an economic develop furthering the economic development plan on uh, Columbus Road, um, which would include um, potentially executing a uh, joint economic development agreement uh, to uh, devote some resources to extending sewer and water um, and uh, an internet capacity to encourage business development in that area. And that area is already populated by businesses and some buildings that should be populated by businesses. So I know, Jeff, you've spent a lot of time on that. I know that group has met several times and is now formulating thoughts on what's important to each one of those constituencies. The last meeting, uh, if you remember, we had a discussion in our last board meeting. We kind of identified a couple of our needs and wants, and we communicated those to Brent Bird at the township. And uh, in our in their last meeting, I think they they discussed all the different entities' needs and wants, and um, those are going to go into the process of drafting the MOU um, that would then kind of solidify everybody's intent and desire to move forward with the CF. So the MOU is a memorandum of understanding that basically encapsulates the agreement of all these groups to to work together collaboratively to support appropriate economic, commercial economic development Correct. in that quarter, uh, which again is meaningful to us. And, and it's one of the reasons I mean, we heard consistently from folks after the last levy campaign who questioned what could be done to encourage economic development. We've certainly been active at SLOs in the community. One of the reasons that even though Mr. Sobel's forecast indicated that we think the levy, if passed in November, will last eight to nine years, perhaps longer, um, we put it a five-year limitation on it to come back to the ballot uh, for the voters to consider in five years to offer views on whether it's the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do, whether it's collecting too much or too little, and also to take into consideration what we hope would be some economic development which would occur in the interim, which would lessen the need for, um, for uh, that amount of the levy. So um, we, we certainly hope that within that five-year period of time, the voters support the levy, we will see some economic development that, uh, that broadens our tax base. Yeah, I actually have something. All right. <laughs> uh, action agenda. Okay. Uh, the action agenda uh, 11.01 is the resolution authorizing the purchase of natural gas service. So moved. Second. Uh, so what we have done in the past and are recommending that we do in the future is uh, get involved in a consortium with Meta on our natural gas uh, purchasing process. Um, it's a consortium buy, so we realize the benefit of scale and volume through that bidding process. And this would give you, uh, or give us the authority to enter into that competitive retail uh, bidding process. And actually give them the authority yes. to take undertake the bidding process. They're getting this approval from all of their the cooperative members. And there are a lot of cooperative members as part of gas purchasing. Um, cooperative. Overall, it gives us more buying power. We can we can outpick our coverage on this one. Yes, yeah. yeah. combining with other folks. Is that mostly school? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that works on campus. Schools. Yeah, significant portion of the schools in Central Ohio are part of the consortium. Questions? Mr. Rowe? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Ms. Davies? Aye. Dr. Corbin? Aye. Mr. Jennings? Aye. Thank you. Uh, 11.02, there is a laundry list of board policy updates. So moved. Second. Uh, I would just remind you from our previous uh, board meeting where we did our first reading, um, almost all of these are related to legislation passed this summer, House uh, Senate Bill 216 and House Bill 318. Uh, those two, one was a deregulation law, the other was a school safety and security um, piece of legislation that had a lot of other uh, tangents to it from a board policy standpoint. And uh, so you have the, the long list of policies and elements. I, I'm sorry. I have a quick question about 
the online fundraising can, campaigns and crowdfunding that just so red where some other districts have been running into issues with that. Yeah. So what we what we discussed in last month's meeting was to include that crowdsourcing or funding process into our um, current student fundraising activity process. So what that looks like is an advisor or a teacher uh, wants to do a fundraising activity, they must submit a, um, an application to the administrator. Uh, that the administrator has to sign off, then it goes to me. Uh, once I sign off and I look at the criteria according to board policy, and I sign off, then it goes to Mr. Sobel for final approval. And uh, that's how our process works. We would include um, any crowdfunding in the same manner from an operating procedure standpoint to try to mitigate and minimize any potential risk. Go ahead, talk to the Yes. And, and then Mrs. Scott, through my office, does a very good job of staying on the advisors to make sure they are following the process and finally their final reports at the end of the fundraiser to make sure and we do evaluate whether they are actually raising money or or, or what the result is. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. The consent agenda 12.01A through C5. Second. All right, so um, what you can see there in the donations area, um, a couple of different things I'd like to point out. Uh, donation from the Wetlands Foundation of $1,000 and uh, $2,000 to the Land Lab. Uh, so we have several things going on in the Land Lab right now. Um, but one of them is a, uh, the design and build of a platform that will go out the north side of the building and it will be a place where somebody who may, maybe not, can't physically go into the land lab can observe that area. Uh, that was, again, a partnership uh, with Terranova and several other entities um, and a student-led project. So you see some of those. Is that North Tone Service? North Tone Service? Yeah, Are they in construct your building? No, I don't think that they're associated with um, the actual construction. No, because Terra Nova is doing Yeah, Terra Nova is doing the construction, but there's several other entities that are funding. Like the Street of Town. Yes, exactly. Uh, the other donations, uh, the safe classroom kits, uh, as you, if you walk around the buildings, you'll see these bright, yellow and green um, boxes that are uh, PTK kits, or treatment kits. Um, they're part of our safety and security plan. And we did a uh, classroom campaign process for people to purchase classroom kits. Um, so we want to thank all those individuals. Um, we have heard some conversation that a large business in the area is planning on uh, partnering with a couple of other entities to potentially purchase uh, PTK kits for all Lincoln County classrooms. Um, I don't know if that's come to fruition yet, but I believe that that uh, might take place here in the near future. Um, the other uh, thing I call your attention to is the resignation of uh, Mrs. Keller, our vocal music teacher at the middle school. Um, she is uh, going to be resigning and retiring. Um, effective, actually effective immediately. So uh, we want to thank her for her service to the community. It was really nice in the band concert. Uh, they, they sang the Grand Old School's alma mater uh, because uh, Mrs. Keller was the one who rearranged that piece several years ago and, and into its current form. And uh, so it was kind of a nice send off for her. But um, we want to recognize her service. <coughs> Questions or comments? Thank you all. Ms. Davis. Aye. Ms. Miller. Aye. Dr. Cornman. Aye. Ms. Bull. Aye. Mr. James. Aye. Great. Ms. Dora Financial. First is the monthly financial statement for September. So moved. Second. 
Um, you guys have probably heard enough for me tonight. Um, I will just highlight two things um, that, just so you're aware, is if you look at the revenues, it looks like we're way ahead of last year, and we are, that's because we got our property tax roll back a month earlier this year than we did last year. Um, so that will flatten out um, when we get to the end of this month because we will not get it again. Um, the other thing, um, just a point of concern, um, yeah, the area purchase services again are running a little faster than I would like them to be running at the end of three months. Um, I have gone and looked at what is driving that. Um, there are primarily three things. Um, the biggest driver has been in the maintenance and area, and that's okay because that's just timing. Um, that just means that we're spending the money a little bit faster uh, than we did last year, we're anticipating that will level out. Because um, there is a budget associated. There is a budget. Yeah, there is a finite budget associated with it, so they can't spend more than the finite budget. So that will level out. Um, the second area, um, yeah. When I said said things were running hot, it's be I would be actually in this area being literal. Um, with the weather being what it is, our electricity costs are running much higher than we anticipated. I'm sure it is because of the constant running of air conditioning, because as you noticed outside today, we have still yet to get to fall. Um, and so I think that's driving the electric. Unfortunately, that probably will stay with us because there's nothing to make up. And of course, the third area is in our instructional services um, are running a little faster than we have forecasted. They're running up about 10%, which we had hoped would not be the case this year. So um, it's demand is higher than it was? It's pr probably a whole slew of things, probably a slew of things yes. Um, so that's where the three areas are. Um, we'll keep an eye on the instructional services um, going forward. But yeah, hopefully there's a little bit of timing in there that will we'll balance out. I said the maintenance will certainly do that. Right. Um, the electricity that we'll probably just you know, be out that money um, because how much we can do about the, the con. All we do is hope that it finally cools off. So we don't have to run the air conditioning constantly. And instructional services is specifically paid to and for what? Uh, there, basically, it's it's most of it is for services for students who are leaving the district to be educated. It is it is the the unfunded mandate area that we talked about that has been the fastest growing line item in the budget and is continuing to be the fastest growing line item in the budget. And one we have no discretion. Correct. That is correct. We have no discretion over it. Questions? Comments? <coughs> Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Corn. Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janine? Aye. Second item, we have a happy report. I actually remember to uh, place <laughs> on the agenda, um, as opposed to the one time a couple years ago, is for you to actually approve the five year forecast so I can file with the state. Second. I was presuming you do not want to hear the presentation again. I thought it was an outstanding presentation. Yeah. I assume you will not want to hear it again. Yeah. yeah. Are there any, any last questions about it? Uh, I don't think I need to talk about it. I had one question that occurred to me afterwards. What's We've been in a historically low inflationary period in the past, right? And I'm not sure if that's going to continue or not. What risk does general inflation have to the five-year forecast, or a forecast in general? Probably the main areas where we have risk in the economy is in fuel. Um, yeah, if, the, if fuel prices start taking off again, you know, we're at the mercy of fuel prices. We can't really control what's going on there. And the rest of it is gen you know, general supplies. If there's inflation, that will affect us. You know, it affects us a little bit in the food service, although yeah, that's outside the general fund. And we've not been running deficits, so that shouldn't be an issue. But the supplies you know, are such a small portion of our budget that you know, even a little more inflation is not going to put terrible strain on, on those purchases. Now, if a extended period of higher inflation 
you know, there, as we talk about base, you know, base and inflationary wage increases, um, you know, we'll need to talk about that if you have an extended period where inflation is running at you know, three or four percent rather than the one or two percent that it's been running at since, um, really since the recession. Um, and so I think that's, you know, since that's our largest area of spending, that's probably also potentially our largest um, risk, but it's also, you know, we do have some control over that as well, though. And to some extent, but I mean, there's, I mean, essentially, salaries and benefits are going to have to track this up to, with inflation, which could effectively bring in the timing of future potential levies. It could. Right. Certainly. With extended inflation. Like you're seeing now. Okay, thank you. Good question. And Mike, with respect to fuel, some years ago I know we looked at potentially hedging some of our fuel costs, locking in some longer term contracts. And of course, the lock dropped out of the fuel market, so it became unnecessary. We actually lost money at the time. But it might be worth looking at and seeing whether there are folks out there doing that. Oil production is increasing, obviously, but um, but I think inflation pressures are um, or something to do that. But I'd be interested in who's maybe having okay. your thoughts about that. Yeah, we can look at that. Well, I mean, you know, one of the other things that we've also talked about, but is really contingent on the levy passing, is you know we have a very small fuel tank tank right now. We can only store so much money, and there's some potential environment. Store so. Fuel, fuel. Right. 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 for the record. I think it's it's gasoline. I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, store so much fuel. Um, you know, and you look, you know, the possibility of getting a larger tank, which would allow us, at times when prices are low, to accumulate more. Um, but there are issues. There are capital issues with that that would have to be addressed that are outside of our ability to do anything. Um, that is another thing that, um, yeah, I, I've talked with Mrs. Sherbert and Mrs. Clary about at least investigating, um, you know, potential of what, of what would be involved in doing something like that if the, re the resources to give us, again, it's a hedge against sure. you, you know, future inflation um, by being able to buy a higher, volume of fuel if prices are lower. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Take the roll, please. Ms. Dave. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jones. Aye. Um, 13 out of 3, their annual resolution declaring transportation impractical. Second. Um, we do the, We are required by state law to transport students to any non-public school that is within a 30-minute drive of our district. Um, some we do anyway, with, you know, like Randall Christian or, or some of those. But Grace Christian School, which we have one family going to, and Marbury Academy, which we have a handful. The cost of doing that is what we deem impractical for the number of students we are doing. So what this allows is for us to pay those families payments in lieu of transportation, which you will get in a, probably another month to approve the payments for those, um, for this, to, to declare those two transportation routes um, impractical for us to fulfill. And it's impractical because we would be required under state law to use costs. We would have to, we would be, would be we would essentially be trans, you know, I think between the two, there are probably 11 students right now, between Marmer and Grace, and like I say, at Grace, it's all one family. Um, so we would be, yeah, we would need to have a bus and a driver to transport 11 kids um, to school in New Albany and Grace Christians in Blacklight, but it is within 30 minutes. Questions? Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Davies. Aye. Ms. Wolf. Aye. Mr. James. Aye. 
Okay, final resolution 1304 is a resolution to do a fund transfer. So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, what we are doing here, this is similar if you remember a couple of years ago. Um, we took one of the funds that was in our system, in our accounting system, and moved it to then the music boosters. Uh, because the nature of the fund, you know, a lot of what they did was external. It was easier for the music boosters to raise the money and to administer um, that fund. What this is doing is a similar thing um, with what's our fund 309.01B, which covers marching band, jazz band, and blue steel. Um, at the recommendation of Mr. Smith, um, it, you know, we had, had discussions over the summer that it makes sense to keep marching band within the district. Mm -hmm. But the other two functions, a lot of what they are doing are fundraising things, paying for trips, going places. They do gigs out in places and get donations for them. And the feeling is that it would make more sense for that money to also flow through the arts boosters. Um, and so what this would do is take an amount, you know, we're still working on the exact amount, of no more than one third for each of the cash balances for each of the programs and move them to the boosters and they would be sep have separate accounts within the boosters. They, they have, the accounts have actually already been set up. They are doing stuff outside of this already. This would just move that cash to the purposes that the, that the boosters would fulfill. That will ease, I think it will ease our accounting burden and it will ease um, some of Mr. Smith's accounting issues that he has to do with. Would this be like, like an annual thing, or is this part of the oh, one, This is a one-time one trip. Time these funds is just they would put their funds the previous budget. For Met, yeah, and basically it's a one-time transfer of the cash, that, you know, portion of the cash that's in the fund to maintain doing the same services, but going in the future, the money being raised is going to go to the boosters right. and funnel through the boosters rather than the district. Remember, this is the taxpayer dollars. This is right. revenue generated by. Yeah. yeah. This is, yeah, that, that was my this, question. Yeah. That, this is money they raised. Yes. 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 Okay. There, is, there is no tax. In Fund 300, um, there are no taxpayer dollars anywhere in Fund 300. That is all raised by the activity, doing whatever the activity. Questions? Mr. Miller. Hi. Ms. Davies. Hi. Mr. Walker. Hi. Dr. Corner. Hi. Mr. Davies. Hi. Ms. Davies. Hi. Dr. Corner. Hi. Mr. Miller. Hi. Mr. Wolf. Hi. Mr. Hi. Thank you all very much.